So what happened to the Whiteite settlement in Texas? Find out more in just a second. Hello, I'm Troy Abels from Hanford, California, and you are listening to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. We're continuing our conversation with historian Mel Johnson. We're going to talk about the end of the White Eye Settlement. How did that end? So Mel will tell us that in just a minute. I was very happy that Ron helped. I transcribed everything. Will Bagley had not heard of the autobiography of John P. Hawley because he discusses Hawley, his experiences with the Mountain Meadow Massacre. Okay, that's where I wanted to go next, actually. That's funny. Okay. So let, let's make sure that we're, we've got our timeline. So he's, he's baptized in 1838. Um, 1845, or 1844, Joseph Smith dies. John P. Hawley joins the Whites. The White Stay, Ites, Stays with the Whiteites. Stays with the Whiteites, moves to Texas for a time. Yeah, I can pick it up from there and go quickly. Okay. Um, they go to Texas. They're in Zodiac for four years. Okay. Um, some say it was polygamy that made them leave because their German neighbors didn't like it. Because they were practicing polygamy. They were. Okay. Uh, others said it was because the Mormons had captured the county government. And if you study Mormon uh, Western colonies and non-Mormon lands, you'll see, well, even in Mormon lands, Mormons always do their best to control the county government. It protects them. Mm -hmm. If you have the sheriff, the constable, the courts, the grand jury, and the judge. And they did that in uh, Zodiac. They ruled for two years. I think there, and then it was cholera, some say, that drove them out. Really what I think it happened was a massive flood early in 1851 destroyed the arable land, the farming land, and they had to go somewhere else. They were a subsistence farming village with uh, milling technology. They go 50 miles northeast to Burnett County, stay two years, but in that two years, they, the last major white-eyed artifact in existence remains out on this hill in cattle country surrounded by cedar, a little U-shaped veil, and there lies this beautiful pioneer limestone cemetery with steps up four and then four steps down into the bed of the cemetery. I have been there twice. It's on private land. Once I didn't have permission, but the second time I did, I took Mark Christensen and Kenny Mays from the business, LDS Business College here, and they liked to write things for the Mormon Times in the Thursday Deseret News. And Kenny said it right when he's looking at this incredibly quiet, sanctified space in solitude. All you hear is the wind, hear the birds, there are no people, and here you have this small, beautiful city of the dead. And he looked all around and he said, this 10 minutes, alone would have been vastly worth all of the money and time that Mark and I spent to get down here. It is truly one of the most holy places I have ever been in my life. And then knowing each of the 14 people, Mormons buried in the cemetery, 13, and the six non-Mormons around the cemetery. Uh, it's about 11 feet wide, probably 18 feet long, and the walls are probably this wide and three feet high. 
you can scrabble over the limestone wall if you want, but you use those stairs to step up. And then when you step down, you step into a different world. It's a different feeling when you're there among the headstones and the footstones. And for me to see the names of people that I had been studying for 20 years or more and see this as their final resting place, it was truly for me, a very special moment. After 1853, they take about a year to get down to their final colony place down in Bandera, Texas, in Bandera Col uh, County. It is west of San Antonio, about 55 miles. Bandera is a typical Texas Western town and county. The Frontier Times Museum is located there. I am the staff historian for the Frontier Times Museum. They have a good Mormon exhibit there, and there they were for four years. That is where the colony finally dissolved, and more than half of the Whiteites stayed in Bandera, and their descendants are there today. Uh, they became cattlemen, they became storekeepers, they became farmers, they owned lots and built houses in Bandera. Some are still there. In 1865, our LDS Revival Mission came to Bandera, Texas after the Civil War, and all of the Banderaites supported the Confederacy. So did the Mormons. They were very militant, very anti-union. And uh, more this is than, states' rights, because the Mormons wanted to practice polygamy, and they thought that was the and and the government, the federal government, had not protected them in Missouri or Illinois. Right. And forty of them were baptized into the RLDS Church, and they had an active chapel there in Bandera for 120 years, and for. Any of you watching and listening, I'm going to put in a plug for 2021 John Whitmer Historical Conference is going to be held in Fredericksburg, Texas. I am trying to get the leadership to organize tours down to Bandera and up to uh, Burnett County and to the cemetery. What's the nearest airport to Fredericksburg? San Antonio. Okay, I like Very San Antonio. Very easy flight in, 50 mile drive. The Admiral Nimitz Museum is in Fredericksburg. Every woman who loves shopping in Texas wants to go to the German Texan shops in Fredericksburg. It is Tourist City Central. And my wife already has it penciled in on her calendar. It's going to be exciting. Uh, any of you interested in white eye history and LDS Texas history in Texas, you should come on down. It'll be great. Uh, back to the dissolution of the colony. The Hollies had left the colony before it got to Bandera. In 1853 and 1854, the Hollies and their relatives, unhappy with Lyman White's latest revelation, lo, we should all go to Mexico. Uh, they said, we're not going to Mexico. We're going to Indian territory. So they went up over the Red River into the Indian nations of what is now Oklahoma and settled in the Cherokee Nation. Uh, they worked a salt uh, mine. They worked for Jacob Croft, a Houstonian who had come to the territory, married a Mormon woman, very wealthy, had slaves, uh, building several sawmills, planing mills up there. And then in 1855, a half Cherokee white gentleman wrote Brigham Young and said, we need Mormon missionaries down here. 
So Henry W. Miller, who had been with the sawmilling company up in Wisconsin, and no friend or relative to George Miller, they quarreled all the time. Uh, as George Miller put the business finances into order for the sawmills and logging fronts, Henry W. Miller was a sawmiller, a very experienced one, and he tripled the output of lumber and timber within two or three months. And they quarreled all the time. It didn't affect the mission. President Miller shows up with some elders, four or five, and then four elders came from St. Louis. Henry B. Irene of the LDS Church's first presidency's great-grandfather. Henry Irene was one of the St. Louis missionaries. Jonathan A. Richards married a Cherokee woman. Henry Irene married a Creek woman. And within about two weeks, the Creek woman didn't have any use for Elder Irene at all. Elder Irene is writing, this daughter of Eve does not listen to her husband, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I think that he married her to get uh, Creek citizenship so that he could stay there and own land and increase the church. That's my belief. Anyway, uh, President Miller and his missionaries were very effective. They organized four branches of Indian membership with Indian elders. And the following spring, uh, Houstonian Jacob Croft is the president of the Jacob Croft Company of 65 souls. John Hawley is sergeant of the guard and they go to Utah. They gather to Zion. My greatest disappointment and failure as a historian in this area, I cannot find any first person accounts or records by the Native Americans, the American Indians, and their experience with the Mormon church in the later 1850s. After the wagon train leaves, there's five elders left. Henry Irene is one of them. Washington Cook is another one. 1860, they will close the mission. And Henry Irene has left his wife by then. And Brigham Young says, come on home. Jonathan A. Richards stays with his wife. She's very wealthy slaves, herds, cattle. And he is there in 1877 when the Indian mission is once again reestablished. And that's a whole different story. And for anybody who is interested in brand new history, do it. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there that is interesting. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Mel Johnson. Polygamy, of course, was a very important topic in early 1800s Mormonism. Was John Hawley a, a polygamist? They turn around to So go, he doesn't want another wife, is that why? He's fighting against <laughs> it, but he wants to be a good Mormon. Right. He wants to inherit all of the blessings that he can inherit. And he's being told, well, the more wives you get, the more blessings you get. So John loves his wife. No problem with monogamy, but blessings, blessings, blessings. That will be <clears throat> a many year struggle for him. If you'd like a transcript of this conversation, we'll have it out shortly. I'd also like to thank you for those of you who are subscribing on patreon.com. Please tell your friends, it's really helpful and will help support future documentaries and podcasts such as this. Also, make sure that you subscribe on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. You can get our Twitter updates at gospeltangents. Also, make sure that you, if you'd like a written copy, go to our Amazon page. You can search for that. I've got a link here, but just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you should be able to find it there.
You can also purchase a transcript of this at gospeltangents.com shop. All of those proceeds will go to me and not to Amazon, so I really encourage you to do that. Make sure that you subscribe on our Apple Podcast page. Um, I've got a link here, but you can just do a search for uh, Gospel Tangents there. If you'd like to get a transcript, click here. To subscribe to here on YouTube, go ahead and click here. And over here, you'll see some of our other videos. Thanks for listening, and we appreciate you listening to Gospel Tangents.